Black Hills TV show with football. Dark Times. I was pretty hesitant to share this music video because we shot it nearly over a year ago, right? So we shot it in October 2022, and here we are in August 2023. Even stuff I shot last week, I'll, I'll lay in bed staring at the ceiling just being like, oh man, I'm going through my head all the things that I, I wish I coulda, woulda, shoulda, you know what I mean? Or Because when you're working at a DIY, ultra low budge level like that, everyone is just trying the best they can. You're working with very limited resources and very limited amount of time. The entire camera and electrical department was three dudes total, myself included. But even, you know, beyond my own insecurities of what internet trolls might say, it doesn't bother me too bad, you know, because it was a year old, you know? There's, there's so many things, I mean, the first thing I can think of that I would have done differently is that crazy rig. So check this out. This is the maximum to not put any stress on your little baby A7S III mount. Got a crossbar built to the handles right there for the easy rig quick release. V-mount on the back to power the monitor. Sits here on the side via NATO. We got the Vaxxas transmitter in the middle. You guys should be paying me to build these rigs, bro. Look at this. Come on now. You know, I, I mean, that that's already evolved since then. I've never had a real job. Like, all I've known is is the world of storytelling, being being part of a narrative, telling a story, you know? And I, I did theater for 10 years, and then in 2010, I started working in the film industry. You know, it takes a lot more than just creating a pretty image to be successful in the film industry. A lot of people don't talk about that on YouTube, and, and it's not mentioned. And I think because not enough people know that, because they don't have enough real-world experience, right? So, um, and, and I think it's important to reiterate those things because talent only gets you so far. You know, talent is just a nice sidecar. It's a nice bonus, right? Your agent can sell you if you're a little bit talented. The reality is you need to, you really need to know your way around set. You need to understand the roles that everyone plays. You need to not only be a good team leader, but at the same time, being a good collaborator. But on top of all of that, you need to understand the politics. Um, the biggest point I want to make that I hope you take with you is understand and respect the process. And I feel like not enough people do those things. They don't respect the process. And they don't understand the process. So I'm only saying that because I was hesitant to show this because it is, you know, almost a year old now. Okay. Let me just block Very nice. Very nice, boys. Okay, my friend, Thomas, yep. when you get on that, let's set that to 2,900. It should go that low. Exactly. Look at that, you just barely feel that, right? Like five, four. Every, try to make everything up so we get your eyes. Cause we're, and I wouldn't do too much of that. Like literally just it's small movements, right? You take it, you eat it. Get in my rag bag. Yeah, what Go do you get need? in my rag bag and grab the four by four muslin. I okay. think I have an unbleached muslin in there. You do, yeah. Yeah, let me see this. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you gotta do this stuff sometimes. Give me a little more out of the TV, maybe. What is it on? Down 25. Let's go up to like 35. Talking to yourself like you're insane. People that you know they call it out, you leave the game. Hear the word, but who's the blame? I keep fighting. Oh, slowly, guys, slowly, slowly, slowly. for walking backwards.
So I had the Patreon submit some questions specifically about this project because I broke this down long ago. Matt Lill, he's been on the Dog Times Patreon since the beginning, I think, since I launched it. And uh, he's local here and he worked with me on it. So shout out to him and shout out to Thomas Pierce because uh, he, he's been known to watch a few of the Dog Times YouTube videos as well. But that was my whole team. Um, so anyways, yeah, I had the Patreon submit some questions and we'll get into those now. Well, the first thing I do when I get to a new location is I try to find the bathroom. <laughs> After that though, the second thing I do is, you know, you suss out the ideas the director has about blocking, right? Like what is the blocking here? Now it's a lot more brutal if you did not get a chance to do a proper location scout, which for the restaurant location for this music video, we definitely were not able to do a location scout up. And that's a big bummer. So at that point, you're just walking in blind. You know, you're basically doing documentary style at that point. And I only say that because in my experience of shooting documentaries, that's how it is. You show up to a spot and you're like, oh, you've never been there. You had no idea what it was. I mean, sometimes with some documentaries, the director doesn't even know where you're going, you know what I mean? So you're thrown into the weeds. Some documentaries have a big enough budget where they can really pull some magic out of nothing, but you know, very rarely in my experience, if you don't have the, the budget or the time to do a proper location scout, yeah, the final image is always gonna hurt because of that. So with the restaurant, the best I could do is like plug the address into Google Maps, you know, and then you pop into Street View, kind of do like a 360 Street View just to get a lay of the land, figure out where the windows are and stuff. But it didn't help me at all for the kitchen. Like we knew that we wanted to be in the kitchen, but you're not gonna get that from Google Maps outside the, the place, you know, but at least what I can do is use the Google Maps view in conjunction with this awesome app that I use called Sunseeker. And what Sunseeker allows you to do is you can go to any spot on the planet Earth and you can jump in time and you can see where the sun is gonna hit that building down to the exact minute. And that's kind of nice. It, it really is helpful for day exteriors, which, you know, I also use for the street stuff. The problem is we got there on the day and what, I mean, look what it was. It was completely overcast gloom and doom, you know, but you only have the talent this day at this time. So you just gotta go with it. You gotta do it, right? And that's the reality of it. I mean, even big budgets would get hit with that wrench, you know? Oh shit, it's overcast here. Oh, the smog is extremely high today here in LA. Well. You know, what do you wanna do? We can't lose all this money, send everybody home and then bring them back tomorrow because it'll be sunnier. You just gotta do it. So, you know, the only people that have the luxury of, of saying, no, we're not, we're gonna wait for the perfect light is guys like, you know, Chivo and Terrence Malick, you know, <laughs> anyone else, you know, no, yeah, you don't get an extra day, just go do it, you know? So you just gotta go wing it, you know? For the studio setting, Luckily, I had shot there before. I knew how tiny it was. I knew the limitations of that studio. And based upon the pre-production conversation with the director, I knew like the shots that she wanted to get. I knew that we had to do a little kitchen thing, a little bathroom thing. We had to make that little hospital room look more like the mom's bedroom. You know, we had the little living room scene with the dad. And I knew how small the spot was. I also knew the very, very short amount of time that we had there. I mean, the living room was, was like a no brainer for me. I was like, yeah, we'll just boom arm the light mat overhead. I mean, I love doing that. And that's just a little Falcon Eyes RX-818. I know everyone's all gung-ho about the Amarans. It's cool, man, light mats are light mats. Since this job, I've gotten a bigger actual light gear light mat. And nowadays I would have just used that, you know, but back then all I had was the little, so this is what I mean by like, it's hard to talk about things that were done almost a year ago, because not only do we evolve as creators, not only do our skills evolve, hopefully, right? But also what's, what's really evolving is our gear list as well, right? So you have to take all that in consideration, you know, but I, I love doing the, the light mat mainly for room tone because they're so small and flexible and you can just boom arm it up above. Now that I have the bigger light gear, a real light gear light mat and it's bicolor and it, it's, it's a lot bigger than the little falconized one. But the size didn't matter so much because it was so down and grungy and dark anyways. I mean, a lot of this, you know, I was wanting to embrace the grunginess and with the A7S III, you can totally do that. Sometimes you gotta build your own depth. We're shooting through these fake curtains. Yeah. In here, we got the Nanlite mix panel with the TV effect. Then we got our light mat overhead, tungsten to match our Astera bulb in the lamp, natural sunlight coming in. Ooh. This is Matt Neal. 
don't know. <laughs> the mom's bedroom. I knew like she was supposed to be like zoned out, like just watching TV by herself. You know, just kind of a mom that's mentally abandoned her kids in a way, I guess. That's the sense I got from it. So, and I knew, okay, yeah, we're going to do the, the TV special effect, the, the TV gag effect with the Nanlite Mix Panel 150, right? And I like to soften it off with the little Chimera softbox that comes with that Nanlite panel. And so I knew stuff like that I was going to do. I always know I'm, I'm going to rely on my little Roscoe dash with the dot for my little eye light. I always rely on that when it's super ultra low light. Now here's the thing that I kind of messed up on this one that we can definitely talk about since we're talking about lights. There's a few moments where you might see the edge light is way too harsh uh, and it's just off, you know? So it happened when the little girl's at the table there, you can feel how harsh that edge light is. And then also when, you know, our main actor is in the kitchen, that edge light's just random and awkward and weird. And, um, you know, as you can see even here with this, I kind of just do these talking heads the same way I do if I'm like on a documentary, you know? So all I'm caring about is a nice super soft key and then a nice little edge. So here I think I've executed it, in my opinion, fairly well, the edge light, right? I'm talking about this little bit just creeping down and you're getting a little bit of separation from the background. It feels hot, but it's not. And the only reason why it feels hot is because I make it a little colder than the key, right? So, and you can see how harsh this actually is when my hand gets closer, but the reality is it's, there's a diff in front of it, so it's super soft by the time it hits my face. The problem is, the reality is it was just too harsh. I was doing it with the Nanlite Forza 60B with the little projector mount, so I was keep, it was too harsh, it's too hard. And that was just something you learn through trial and error, right? That's back when I was doing edge lights with a hard light. Well, nowadays, this is just with a soft, that's another soft box back there. So now I'm softening it. And you, as you can see, you can still shape it because I got a sound blanket right here for negative fill, right? So you can cut that edge off and, and keep it soft enough so it's not harsh like it was in our music video. You can keep it softer and you can use the negative fill to like, cut it out wherever you want to cut it out at so because you don't want your edge light way over here and now it's not an edge right now it's something else right but right now it's like a nice little edge and it doesn't matter if you don't like it I like it right so now we're getting into that topic again you know <laughs> working as a freelance cinematographer here in LA on a very ultra low budge scale right you get a lot of green producers and directors that's just the reality of low budge and that's not you know, being mean towards anyone, that's just being honest, right? It can be a fun time, you know, it, it can be a fun collaboration, but, and again, this is not specific to this job. I'm just speaking in general here. I've also worked with directors that are super green, don't have any credits, and yet they want to act like, you know, they're the next Stanley Kubrick. And I literally call this the Kubrick complex because I've ran into it so many times. When they try to pretend like they know what's going on when they really don't, and trust me, someone like me who's been on sets for 13 years, I can tell within the first five minutes how much experience a director has. No doubt, right? And I'm talking about, I mainly learned that through all of my years as an actor. As an actor, you work very closely with a wide gamut of directors, right? I mean, granted, you're going to have different kinds of directors. You're going to have directors that are very hands-on, more absorbed with talent. You're going to have more directors that are technical, more absorbed with what's going on with camera. Sometimes they're a little bit spread across the board. It's like, dude, just own it. You're only hurting your final product by not just like coming clean with everyone what we all already know anyways, right? Like anybody that's spent any amount of time on real sets can know when someone doesn't know what the hell they're doing. You know what I mean? So you're not fooling anybody, right? You're just making yourself look worse, honestly. And, and they're hurting the final product. Again, this is not specific to this job at all. You know, I enjoy working with Lisa. She, she's a character, she's fun, she's cool. I'm just speaking in general. On this one, it is way more collaborative. You know, Lisa, um, totally is open to my ideas and um, maybe sometimes she shouldn't be, you know, like I don't, you know, my problem is, is I, I can be way too ambitious. You know what I mean? Like I'll be like, oh yeah, we can do this one or like for the kitchen, for instance, you know, like I was all gung ho for this idea of, of this idea that she had of doing this one or from the kitchen, doing the dishes all the way out to the lobby. Now, the downside is, is like, we weren't able to make this look cinematic because we didn't have time to light this whole space. Camera's practically looking 360 degrees. So that's why in the final edit, it's all chopped up, you know, because it just wasn't working. But also, I don't think it was timing out correctly with the actual song. And it, it is what it is. You know, you take a chance and you just try to go with it. 
far as working with artists, as the DP, I don't really get in that realm working with the artists too much. You know, I, I might just give little notes, like little tiny blocking ideas or something. You know, I wanna make sure they're staying open to camera, obviously. I wanna make sure that they're facing towards the key light rather than away. You know, these types of things, those are just little notes that I would give to an artist for a music video or even actors in a, in a narrative piece, you know, because I have way more experience in the narrative world. And I think that's why I was brought onto this specific music video. I haven't done a whole lot of music videos. Music videos aren't really my thing. I'm not a big showy cinematographer, you know? I'm, I'm not into like all the big elaborate camera movements. And, and I think a lot of it is gimmicky, honestly. So as creators, we're, we're just, we're gravitating towards the stuff we're into. I'm a huge P.T. Anderson fan. And you're talking about films that are still, like very still and almost m melodic and poetic almost, you know? So that's, that's the kind of world that I come from. Not that this music video has any elements of P.T. Anderson imagery. <laughs> I just approach things from a very narrative standpoint where this specific music video, the way, the, the vision that the artist and producer and director had, it was very narrative. Like they wanted to tell the story of how he came up, you know? So I think that's why I was brought on because, you know, I just, I know narrative stuff. It's all I know basically is narrative stuff. That's perfect, that ties into what we were just talking about. So it is hard for me, difficult for me too, big time to, to jump from what I'm used to in the narrative world, having shot three feature films and like 40 short films. All I know is narrative and I've shot a fair share of documentary stuff too. So you take that in consideration and then like what, I've done like maybe six music videos in, in six years, you know, like I don't do a whole lot of music videos. And I think it's very telling because maybe I'm too literal when I think of music videos because certainly, and I've been doing this since I was a kid, when I listen to songs that I really like, my brain just comes up with a music video in my head. And it's been a thing that I've had since I was a kid, you know. The older I get and I think about that, it's like, they're, they're pretty literal. You know, it, it, it is childish. If you take that into consideration and then you look at how David Fincher's career started, who David Fincher is one of my all time favorite directors as well. You look at, he started the music video business and his music videos were so profoundly different, certainly for that era, you know, you're talking about the 1980s, just way different. The stuff he was doing with Madonna and Rick Springfield and David Bowie and these, and all of his stuff was like very futuristic. This kind of like almost Blade Runner-ish thing that he had this like theme and genre that he had going on. It was very out of the box. And I think really good music video creators are really good at thinking outside of the box. And that's something that I've always wanted to push myself towards as a cinematographer myself, because I'm not a cinematographer. I, I, I was an actor first for what, like 20 years, right? So all I know is that performance level side of things. I'm not inherently born as a natural born image maker. I, I'm not. So I have basically had to train myself how to have a photographic eye or be a cinematographer, right? So um, it, it's harder then, you know what I mean? You, it is very stressful then because not only do you have to learn the technical stuff, but I also have to learn the creative stuff where most guys are already creative and then all they have to do is learn the technical stuff and then they're golden. Well, me, I'm, I'm I'm like having to learn both constantly all day long for the past six years, right? And so the one thing I will say, even in my narrative work, people that I latch onto are people that are thinking outside of the box in the narrative world, right? So now I'm thinking of guys like Adam Newport Barra, who is like profoundly different. You know, he was the guy that shot The Last Black Man in San Francisco. Well, since then he has shot Euphoria, he shot Outer Range, he has shot so many Kendrick Lamar music videos. I mean, the guy is amazing. He just recently got nominated for his, his works. So the dude rocks, man. And it's so outside of the box. And that's what I love about the work. And not only is it outside the box, but it looks good. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and I think about the same when I think of shows like The Outsider, right? Or, or Handmaid's Tale. I watch those shows. Not only is the story good, the cinematography is just just as good as the story. And it's not trying to be better than the story, right? What they're doing, it matches perfectly well. It melds perfectly, right? And when I watch other YouTube content creators, I think the main key that they are also missing is it, like when I watch any content online, it all ends up looking the same to me. Like it ends, it's like, this is very cookie cuttery what's going on right now. Like everybody's stuff looks exactly the same down to their websites. Like everything looks the same. Like if I like, if you took away people's names and you just went to people's websites, it would be like, I wouldn't know who's who, right? So it's really hard nowadays to 
I feel like it's hard for uh, filmmakers and cinematographers, certainly, to, to define their voice and define who they are. And and that's something I've been battling with. And, and I'm I am like I, I I am in the bottom low tier, right? We all know that because I'm so I'm I only got six years in, right? Six years ago, I didn't even know what f-stop was, right? And the only reason I started doing this stuff is because I wanted to be a director that knew how to communicate with his DP. Because I was directing towards the end of my acting uh, career there, and 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 I I have no problem talking with actors. I have a master's in acting, you know, so I, I didn't care about that. Like I I am actor. I speak actor. I had John Schweigart, who was my cinematographer on a couple of my short films. I had no idea what he and, him and his team were doing. I was completely, I mean, I know what I know what they do, right? I know their role, but like in regards to like specifically from a technical standpoint, I didn't really understand what that camera was doing. So as a director, I, I needed to know that. I felt that I needed to know exactly what that camera was doing so I could have better communication with my cinematographer. On this job, you know, the poor guy was left with a little tiny Bluetooth speaker. We had another one and it, it, we just couldn't get it to connect. I've been on some music videos, like in my gaffing days, I've, I've been on some really cool music videos, like big high-end music videos, which is cool. And I had the opportunity to be the gaffer on those and really only got it again, just because people know my experience on sets and people kind of like my energy, like to be around me, but also um, I give it my all, you know, and I talk about this all the time on the Patreon too. It's like, dude, I, I'm gonna give it my 150%. I don't care if, at what my role is, if I've accepted the job and I've accepted the rate, whatever it is, I'm not going to let the rate dictate my performance. When I get there on the day, it's going to be me. You got me or nothing, man. And I always give it my all, right? And, and regardless of what, you know, the peanut gallery might say in the comments or whatever it is, it's like, well, you don't know what went on on the day. You know what I mean? So we don't care what you have to share. You know what I mean? It's like the reality is everyone shed their blood, sweat, and tears to create this, right? So it is what it is, right? Like you get what you get. I always give it my all. Like that's all I can do. And, and I hope that's all anyone else can do too. This lifestyle is ups and downs, you know? When you choose to work in the entertainment business, it's going to be a roller coaster. It's not all going to be rainbows and unicorns, right? You're not all going to be Peter McKinnon's from the YouTube side, and you're not all going to be Sir Roger Deakins from the real Hollywood side, right? Like, that's the reality of it. The reality of it is if, like, if you can just get yourself on set uh, doing the thing that you love to do, that, that's, that's a win right there, right? And so regardless of the rate, you should just own it and perform your 150%. And if you suck, you suck. Well, that's okay. We all suck. That's the reason why you're doing the job, is so you'll suck a little less. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. The question was sinking sound on set. <laughs> uh, I've been... <laughs> that's all gotten because I was talking about the music videos I used to gaff on. Because I've, I've been on those music video sets where they have huge, like, speaker system. Uh, it really comes down to the performer, you know? But... I, I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think they need decent boom box at least, you know, they need something more than a little Bluetooth speaker. I'm trying to have empathy for the artist here, you know, like, because you can, you're all, you're probably already nervous, like having cameras and people around you and then you got to sing and maybe you're used to being in the studio where you can hear yourself with the earbuds or the headphones, you know, like I'm just thinking realistically, you know, so y you need something a little more beefier than a little Bluetooth speaker. So we had a bigger speaker, we just couldn't get it to work. Um, uh, so that was a bummer. So I had to resort to something even smaller. It was still at least a little Bluetooth speaker, but it wasn't the one that we were hoping to use. Um, that's always a bummer when that happens. And you feel bad for the artist, you know, and and the biggest bummer is, is because, yeah, it, in the long run, it, def it it could probably affect the performance for sure, I would think. So, yeah, I would definitely want to um, have the best, some of the best audio you can get. I think when they have the crazy big speaker, it's a little overkill if you got to wear, you know, eardrum protectors. That's a little, that's a little crazy to me, but you got to have something in the middle, I think. It would do best, like, I remember one of the first music videos I did, the music producer, like the producer of the song was on set with us, and he had like a thing where he was watching the timer, like of the song. So we would take a shot of that with our slate next to it and it would all, then you have a visual of everything. And then of course, yeah, if you're jumping frame rates, then you gotta kind of do that math in your head too. You know, whether you're gonna do it two times forward or two times backward, and it, it's tricky. Again, coming from the narrative world, that's a little foreign to me. 
I was hoping to find someone that wanted to trade the Sony FX6 for my Komodo package. <laughs> That's really what I was, and here's the thing, like, and this is gonna get crazy. Here's the thing. I am a, I will always be a fan of red. I love the Komodo. One of the reasons that I won't just let it go for dirt cheap, what, what anybody would buy it for, is, is because there's realities about that camera. The very obvious, the global shutter, the 6K, the R3D RAW, right? I mean, those three things alone, and then also the fact that it's the perfect B-cam for the Raptor or anything like that. So, you know, you, you, you gotta think about that. And I know some guys be like, well, no, the X is the perfect B-cam for the Raptor. Well, I, I don't know. I think the X is, is a good A-cam on its own, but that's just me, right? But me, being as someone that used the Komodo OG as a main A-cam on uh, a, an entire feature film, and I don't know how many friggin' short films, right? Like, I know what that camera's capable of, and I know it's downsized, which isn't very much, honestly, I don't think. But here's the thing. So they're like, well, why then, Justin? Why do you want the FX6? Well, because the A7S III is an underdog's dream camera. For instance, this music video, right? The entire crew was three people outside. We did have a production designer, so shout out to him. But outside of him, like I'm talking about camera and lighting was three people, myself included. It's a very tiny crew for doing four locations, right? Like it's small. I wasn't gonna make my life harder by choosing to shoot on the Komodo, right? Like that would be insanity. Like, and I knew we had to do the gimbal stuff not only outside, like we were walking, doing all the walking stuff outside on the street, but also in the kitchen. Like originally we went in with this game plan of doing this one which we did with the Sony. Just because we didn't use it, it doesn't mean that it didn't happen, right? In my opinion, the Komodo is a gigantic pain in the ass to balance on the gimbal. I'm not saying it can't be done because I've totally done it. I've done it with the Sigma Art for crying out loud. But the reality is it, it takes a lot of time. Meanwhile, I can take that little A7S III and you don't, I don't have to balance at all. I throw it on the RS2 and I hit the calibrate button and you're good to go. Like that's literally how fast it is. So, I mean, I think about all the time, like I, one of my good buddies, shout out to John Mark here in LA. For a minute there, he was shooting weddings on red Komodo, two Komodos. And I just thought he was the craziest man alive. Cause I'm like, why, why do people do this to themselves? Like, wh why would you make your life that much harder using a camera that it has n no autofocus that's reliable, let's be honest, right? So first of all, like as someone that used to shoot reality doc stuff without autofocus capable cameras, and I hated my life and I hated the image, like why do you wanna hurt yourself that bad? Like if I'm a one man band, that's exactly why I bought the A7S III. It just made my life easier. This music video, yeah, may not be a one man band, but hell dude, we're total documentary style, right? It's three people total. Like having that autofocus came in clutch so many times. If you don't have the budget for someone to sit there and pull focus for you, rather they can be out helping set up the next shot or, you know, whatever. Like, you know, yeah, we don't, we, we don't have the resources. We don't have the luxury of a first AC and also having a grip. Right, so we gotta split the balance here, man. I know how amazing the autofocus is on the A7S III, and I'm sitting here just thinking like, well, dude, it would make more sense for me to ditch the Komodo and just get an FX6, and I could have a killer combo. And you can shoot narratives on it. They both have the codec for all of those guys obsessed with Netflix approval, but at the same time, you can do amazing stuff even for corporate stuff, documentary stuff, because now you got two perfectly matching cameras with amazing autofocus. And the reality is too, I already have this big servo zoom lens. That to me is so much fun on the A7S III and I can only imagine how much fun it would be on the FX6, you know? As much as it would break my heart to let the Komodo go, the reality is if I was a rich man, I would keep the Komodo and just also have the FX6, but I'm not a rich man. I have never not replaced one camera with another because I don't like to be a rental house and I also don't like to be a collector. So it's like, I don't like things sitting around not working. And the reality is the red Komodo only went out on three jobs this entire year. Well, here it is August and it only went out on three jobs. Let's get a camera that is of that caliber that is actually going out on jobs so I don't have to break my back rigging out this little mirrorless A7S III, you know? <laughs> back when I got the Komodo, I was shooting a lot more like narrative stuff, but this past year, it's been more like documentary style stuff. And the reality is like budgets are tight right now. You know, you got the whole strike going on. You got the writer strike and then also now the SAG strike. So 
And people go, well, how's that affecting you? You know, you're not in IATSE and all of this, but it doesn't matter. Like the reality is it trickles down. So if those big guys aren't on their big union sets, well, what do you think they're doing for work? Well, they're doing all the corporate stuff. You know what I mean? They're doing the stuff that I would normally do. It's like, well, great. Now I don't have a gig, you know, like that's the reality of it. Like that's how it goes. So now I got to jump back down to the doc side of things, back to the corporate side of things. And it's like, okay, well, that's just a reality of the, of this year. And it's like, well, if that's where I'm at, then I need, I need more cameras capable of that work. I look at all of these gear items as tools and just that they're just tools to me, you know, regardless of like all this fanboy talk and all this, I'm not loyal to anybody. Like, even if I say, well, yeah, I love the Komodo, but that, that doesn't mean like I'm married to it. Like, it's just like, th that was a tool that worked for me for nearly three years, but now it's a tool that doesn't really get used anymore based upon just the signs of the time where I, where I'm at right now, where other, this other tool is. But yeah, this one had some company moves and Matt, Matt knows cause he was there. It is hard in LA when you have company moves. Luckily these ones weren't so bad. Like at least we were in the same area. You know, it's not like we were jumping city to city. I have been on jobs where man, Man, I've been on some brutal company moves and that's just lack of uh, proper scheduling and proper planning, right? W which again, you get a lot of in the low budget indie world, you know? <laughs> this one wasn't that bad. I don't think this one was that bad. Maybe Matt has a different memory of it, but to me, it's like, well, it was all in Santa Clarita. So to me, that's awesome. What's worse is when you have a company move in a totally different city, D dude, in LA, that's a big deal. You know what I mean? Like it can, if, if it's the wrong time of day, it could take you an hour and a half just to go 15 miles, dude. Like no lie. Like it can get crazy real quick. So the fact that it was all in the same city, uh, like I was stoked about that. But with that being said, yeah, you know, you have that little bug in the back of your ear being like, dude, you got to get out of this studio, you know, as small as it is, it still has sessions blocked. There was a group of guys outside waiting for us to get out of there so they could come in, you know, and plus two, if you stay any time over, you're going to get charged the whole hour, the whole hour, right? So you got to get out of there. And, you know, and that's just the reality of being in a town like LA. You don't want to be an expensive DP for your producers and directors because they're never going to work with you again. Right? And I'm not just talking about your day rate. I'm talking about like, don't make them spend more money because you were not working efficiently enough. You know, in my early days, I had guys take my gear and throw it outside in the parking lot and I flipped. But, you know, it was because it was early. Early on when I was practicing cinematography and I just, you know, I, I'm pretty bad at that. You know, I, I have grown a, a lot in the past six years, but man, in the beginning, I mean, I would tinker forever with a light and it would still look like dog shit, right? Like, I think we've all been there, you know, but, but yeah, like if you know, you got some other place to be, you're going to work even more rapidly and, uh, or hopefully. So that's why with the studio, I got lucky, you know, cause I shot there before. So I used the awesome shot designer app to create overhead and I share those with everybody. I mean, I send out mass email to director, producer, everybody on the team. I do that on all jobs. Again, I, it doesn't matter how, how low the, the, the rate is that I've accepted to, and I'm still gonna do all the same stuff that I would do regardless. And the reason why I bring up the shot designs is because that saves you a lot of time. You, just because you made an overhead lighting design, that doesn't mean you have to do that. It doesn't mean you have to be married to that, but that's like, that's like the going in start, right? Like that's like, you know exactly what gear is getting pulled out of the van. You can tell the guys like, look, you can pull it up on the iPad and I go, this is this, this is this, this goes here. They can look at it. You leave the iPad on, on the cart and they just, they're rigging it up, following along. It's like them like connecting the dots, you know? Then when you get it all set up, then you can sit back, look at the monitor. Hmm, hmm, do we like this? Hmm. No, let's tweak this. Okay, adjust this. Let me check the color temp here. Okay, let's move this. In the case of the restaurant, there were no overheads because uh, there was no location. Scott had never been there before, couldn't get inside. So in that scenario, then I'm walking in and I'm seeing what I, you know, we're, we're figuring out the blocking. If I can make little fine tune adjustments to help the blocking out. But the reality is we were really short on time at the restaurant too. And I said, you know what? I'm not even, we don't have the time and resources to m recreate this whole look lighting wise, right? So I said, let's work off of these nasty green fluorescent overheads in the kitchen. Let it be grungy. It's a kitchen. It's a diner kitchen. Let it be gross right? I can use my color meter. We can balance the camera to it and we'll just let it be gross. And when we pull back out to the world, 
we can hit somewhere in the middle and, and we'll just fine tune it in post. You know, we're just, we're trying to work our way around it. Make sure you get the color chart both in the kitchen and out in the, in the dining area so you can work that in post. You know, you, you just, you, you gotta work with it the way you can. And maybe it was better for the color uh, in the long run that we had to chop up the, the Warner because it was supposed to start in the kitchen and go all the way out to the front door, but it didn't work like that in the edit. Maybe it was better in the long run. Yeah, I think all the stuff that I said, you know, the Sunseeker app comes in clutch, the Shot Designer app. Even if you did the location scout, it's still good to plug the address into Google Maps and into Sunseeker and just see what's going on at the location. Just so you can be aware of when the sun's coming through a window. I mean, obviously there's also apps like Helios that you can use on the day and you can literally like point your phone and it'll show you where the sun is and the route it's going. Like you can do that on the day too. So pre-pro wise, I always use all the apps to my disposal and I always always love to get directors' visions through reference ideas. Send me some examples of what, what you want this to kind of be like in terms of tone and style. Like, what are you after, right? Because I'm a visual person. Like, I can't, like a director can tell me all these thoughts and ideas, but but if they don't like give me something tangible that I can look at, if they don't give me photographs or, or clips or just, you know, whatever it is, like it needs to be something visual that I can see from the director. It can be anything, right? And and that's all it takes for me to, to get in my brain, like, okay, this is the style they're after, you know? And then I take that ball and I just run with it, you know? Like, so I'm just a dog chasing cars, you know? <laughs> That's the reality of it. I was pretty bummed out to see the edit and to know like they cut all that up. In my mind, I was like, dude, we wasted all that time getting that long tracking shot. And it wasn't anyone's fault. I mean, a lot of it might've been my own fault, you know, cause I was so gung ho on doing it too. Like we were all gung ho on doing it. And it's just, uh, it's heartbreaking to see when it, when it couldn't work for the edit. And if I could have went back and, and just, we'd done it differently, well, obviously we would have had that extra time rather than wasting all the time doing the one -er over and over, we would have just lit the kitchen a better way. I wouldn't have worked off the grunginess, right? We would have built our own grunginess with our film lights, right? And then we could have come out to the kitchen, and, you know, because when you're doing a long winter like that, you're essentially, uh, sh you're lighting for 360 degrees. And it's, it's almost impossible to do that and make it look good when you're on a really ultra low budget. And that's just how it goes. Like w no one can predict the future. No one could have jumped in time and been like, oh, this is not gonna work for the edit. You know, like no one had the foresight to predict that. So it just came out the way it came out. It would have been nice to, I guess, just sit back and maybe before we even started filming in there, like, right, just like, hey, let's just walk this out while blaring the song and let's just see if this is gonna time out, right? And that, right, we would have learned right then and there, like, this isn't gonna work. This isn't timing out, you know? We were playing the song because I remember, I remember hearing it. The problem was all of us in the kitchen couldn't hear what was happening out there. Maybe some stuff got lost in translation. For whatever reason, we thought we could pull it off. But I think the reality was if we would have just really just walked it out and timed it out without any camera or anything, you know, sure, use Artemis Pro or whatever you need to do, but, you know, just walk it out with that music and see, like, because when it is a timing thing like that, it's, it, we, we learn the hard way. It's crucial to know, like, oh, this is not timing out. Let's not waste our time doing this winter and let's just focus on, you know, getting the lighting a little better and, and taking our time, like do the stuff we need to do in the kitchen. Then we can wrap out of the kitchen, move all the gear to the dining area and then focus on this. It would have saved us a little time. I don't know how much time um, because, because we still did a lot there in a very, very short amount of time. And in the lobby, I was just working off of Astera Nix bulbs and uh, hid the Nanlite panel where I could, hid my little cream source where I could. You know, you just like, you're at the mercy of it, of the low budge world. I try not to let it get me down, you know? When I'm in it, I'm in it, man. I'm like, dude, throw, let's put this over here, put that, you know, like we're doing it, you know? And I guess that mentality just comes from the documentary side of things where you're just like, dude, we're doing this, dude. Like, just do it, you know? <laughs> no matter what's going on, no matter what kind of director or producers I'm working with, I always just try my best to be like, you know, I, here's the thing. If they come up to me and ask me, 
I'm going to be real with them because I cannot lie to people, right? So if I'm not into the lighting or I'm not into this or that, like I'll say like, hey, yeah, this is kind of weird to me. You know, like I'll be real with them. I'll be honest with them. But at the same time, I'm a team player. Like, dude, if this is what the director wants, it may not be what I agree with, but we're going to go in and do it, right? Because that's my job as a cinematographer. I can give suggestions, right? I can give some pointers. I can say why I don't think it might not work and I can give my options and hopefully I have a couple of them and if they still want to go the way they want to go hey man that's what I have to do too because they're the director they're the driving force they're the visionary it's their ship right the DP is just the little co-captain you know so I think a lot of DPs have a hard time grasping that too not exactly wrong about it you know I, I do think like a director I do think about the end product constantly. Um, and I do think about more than just the image that's being captured. I think we went on long enough here. This was a good this was a good one though. We'll see how it goes. We'll see what the turnout is on this one. Hopefully you guys gleaned something out of this. If nothing else, it'll be better next time. <laughs>